welcome everyone. I'm Eric Best. I'm the CEO at Mercent. And uh, for the next few minutes, I'll be talking with uh, Andy Lloyd, the GM of Commerce at NetSuite. And uh, we're really going to talk about how the uh, retail landscape is evolving, namely uh, how retailers from a strategic and tactical standpoint are thinking about profit maximization uh, in a world where Amazon, Google, and mobile devices are uh, creating unprecedented pricing and availability information to the consumer and effectively, I'd say, uh, shifting the balance of power toward the shopper. So, uh, Andy, thanks for being here. And uh, why don't we just kick things off? Uh, I know you guys are, are very busy at NetSuite in the uh, enterprise commerce space. Yep. You want to just talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the market and where you guys are investing in the technology? Yeah, I think you know we, like a lot of people, are seeing huge opportunities in the uh, in the omni-channel commerce world. Um, you know, I think it's it's a, a challenge and an opportunity for retailers that, uh, that that frankly is a little bit overdue to be tackled. And for a long time, there has been a real technical limitation in terms of running both your in-store experience and your e-commerce platform on top, you know, on top of a single data source, um, which, you know, when you start talking about measuring profitability uh, or, or maximizing profitability, the first step is actually being able to measure that you're, whether you're being profitable or not. And that's a really challenging thing to do when you're only getting a picture of e-commerce transactions or in a different system, you're only getting a picture of point of sale or in-store transactions. Um, and so, so the, a lot of what we wrestle with is allowing retailers to actually quantify profit across all the different channels. And it's, it's, a, big, it's a big challenge, but it's a big area of focus for us. Yeah, you bring up an interesting point that of course, the, the disruption and the opportunity in the market uh, that players like Amazon and Google and also the device uh, providers in, in tablet and mobile uh, it, are creating affects offline retail maybe ultimately more than it affects e-commerce. And so that has implications on ERP and point of sale and ultimately the in-store shopper experience. How are you guys thinking about that at NetSuite? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you look at it, I, I think that part of what you're what you're trying to do is be aware of what's going on in the market, but avoid just a, a blatant race to the bottom in terms of price. And uh, you know, when we look at you know what Mercent brings to the table, I, th I think one of the things that's really interesting is the price monitoring that you do, so you can actually be aware of what your customers are doing, and you don't necessarily have to sell the product as cheaply as possible. You can be educated about what's out there in the market, and so um, you know, using insights that are gleaned from the internet, where everything is very measurable but to drive the in-store pricing is, is an important piece. Um, a lot of our customers have, have taken much more of an art-based approach to how they price products in-store, and, you know, and, and that's largely been a function of you know, having two sides of the house. There's been the e-commerce side, which has generally been more quantitative and more scientific, and then there's been the in-store experience, which has been a little more driven by, I'd say, um, you know, for lack of a better term, old school or traditional retailing um, and merchandising. And so I think that it, there's, there's a great opportunity to take the learnings from e-commerce and as more and more people are focused on omni-channel and focused across channels to infuse that quantitative orientation into the in-store shopping experience, whether it's through pricing or product assortment or any other means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at Mercent, we, we've certainly seen a situation where uh, you know, two years ago, marketing was a function of optimizing bidding for placement and making sure that keywords were being uh, properly managed both on a paid and organic basis uh, and that creative uh, copy in the ad was really driving visibility. And uh, when you look at what Amazon has done disruptively in the market, you know, the signals that drive relevancy on a product detail page are of course your reputation as a merchant, uh, the competitiveness of your price the latency of your shipping, your ability to get the product to the doorstep faster, uh, and of course shipping cost as well. Um, and effectively what that's done for our business is move us further up, up into the merchandising function of the business. Um, and, and really it makes marketing ultimately a data-driven uh, operational discipline. Right. Um, and that seems really consistent with this comment you made earlier about data centralization, kind of unification. Yeah. Um, you want to touch on on maybe uh, how you guys envision sort of a common data data platform or data stream that starts with demand 
uh, generation and ends with uh, shipment and, and post-sale customer support? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we really, I think that one of the challenges that has existed has been around quantifying customer lifetime value. Um, because a traditional retailer, you know, 10%, 15% of their transactions may be flowing through the website, but the reality is, is if you're quantifying return on investment based upon your initial keyword buy, you're really missing a huge piece of the equation because most of your customers are not only shopping with you online, not only shopping with you in store, but they're crossing over, they're visiting multiple different retail locations. And so, um, you know, a, a lot of what we've encouraged our customers to do is just as you alluded to is look at the value of a customer and look at the transaction life cycle and the, the lifetime relationship with a customer as more than just an initial transaction. Because the initial transaction is probably going to be the least profitable transaction you see across the entire customer lifetime value. You. And so, you know, when you're able to quantify, well, you know, I may have actually lost money on my initial acquisition of this customer, but then through the course of the relationship that, you know, we've, you know, they've had gone forward and had three or four different transactions, that's, um, you know, that's something where it can definitely provide a competitive advantage. And so I think that initial customer acquisition and pricing strategy is a really important piece of making sure that you're really focused on the overall health of the business. So earlier, you and I were talking a bit about paid search and just how the overall PPC market is evolving. Um, it seems like what you're saying is, you know, revenue as a measure of return on advertising spend is maybe uh, a, a metric that we were focused on in, in 2011. 2012, we got a little more sophisticated by looking at the gross margin uh, return on ad spend. And now, really, we need to look at the, the lifetime gross margin or lifetime contribution margin of a customer. It, and, and clearly the challenge then, of course, becomes how, how do you do that when you're dealing with an omni-channel uh, company? Right. So uh, are, do you think retailers are uh, in a position where they're able, they're, 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 they're at the point where they have the tools and the sophistication to be able to kind of rationalize what's happening in terms of in-store customer acquisition with online customer acquisition? Uh, largely, no. I mean, you know, to be completely honest, I think that the challenge when you start looking at profitability, product profitability, um, is that it, it's very unusual to actually be able to get all the data from all the different systems that are involved. So a typical, um, you know, quantifying pro customer profitability or product profitability requires not just information about all the transactions across all the different channels, but it also requires a correlation back to the actual gross margin of a product, your actual shipping costs associated with, with uh, a particular order. Um, all of those factors come into play. And what we see when we go into a typical retailer is that they've taken a channel-specific approach to implementing a lot of these solutions. Um, so they have a point of sale system that maybe they bought to, for a Y2K upgrade. And then the e-commerce platform got updated in about 2005. And then they're running you know, QuickBooks or some other system on the back end to, to manage their finances. And they may have some sort of CRM system in place. And, and when you start trying to stitch together data about your customers, stitch together data about your products, uh, stitch together data about, the, about profitability and expense from across all those different systems, it, it's, it's virtually impossible to piece Humpty Dumpty back together again. And so, um, you know, so, so that's uh, what we're seeing is retailers going from playing a game of whack-a-mole where a customer comes along and says, we want mobile commerce, and so they run out and they get a mobile commerce solution, and then they come along and they say, well, now we want an iPad application. So they build an iPad application, and they're doing all these things on a point-by-point -point basis. We're starting to see a realization that stitching these things together and gluing these things together is not a viable long-term strategy, because you do need to get to this true profitability, and, and it's a very difficult thing to do based upon the IT trajectory that these people have been on. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would add to the to that the fact that increasingly, uh, from platform providers like Google, obviously we're seeing ad units now that are explicitly mobile. They're explicitly local, tied to store specific inventory and pricing information, um, and they're location aware in terms of uh, uh, the the ad being served to the consumer. You know, when they, when they're actually geographically in market. Uh, at a physical store, so that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I've got one other question for you. So you guys are, are a SaaS delivery model, of course, versus on-premise. Right. And um, you know, traditionally, I think SaaS, uh, for, for our part at Mercent, 
our, our cu target customer is kind of mid-market to enterprise. We serve a lot of big brands uh, and a lot of high growth companies as well. H how do you see the needs of your customers differing, or maybe they're, they're very similar, um, but enterprise is getting more comfortable with the idea of SaaS adoption. Um, but, but how do you think about your customer base in terms of mid-market versus enterprise? Yeah, so we, uh, at, our, at our Sweet World show last month, we announced a fairly high profile win with Williams-Sonoma powering their entire omni-channel international expansion on top of NetSuite. Um, and, and so that was obviously a great win for us. Um, what we see, for the most part, in terms of using NetSuite, a lot of people who are using NetSuite are using it for international subsidiaries. The parts of their business that need to be agile with limited resources. Because when you start talking to someone like Williams-Sonoma, you know, going in and asking them to replace all of their retail systems or all of their e-commerce systems is a fairly significant undertaking. So on the enterprise side of the, the largest organizations, we're seeing a lot of adoption for international subsidiaries where they're actually starting to adopt cloud more on the periphery. Um, on the, in the mid-market, you know, there's definitely, I think, much more of a need for um, a, a new set of systems. Because when you look at a, a, you know, a company like Williams-Sonoma or Toys R Us was on stage at shop.org last year, they're a, or Nordstrom is kind of a case study, they're able to spend hundreds of millions of dollars of integrating together these disparate systems. Whereas a typical mid-market retailer has no hope of being able to get that kind of budget to stitch together these systems. And so they're saying, well, if we really want to deliver on our customer expectations, for cross-channel, omni-channel shopping, we actually need to revisit everything that we're doing because otherwise we're going to continually be bleeding hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to try and stitch together these systems that were never designed for an omni-channel world. Um, so on the, on the mid-market side of things, I, you know, I think that we're actually seeing a, a lot of companies that thought that the omni-channel dream was out of reach. They, they almost, in many cases, are hopeless that they would ever have been able to achieve what their customers were asking them for. But by moving to a cloud model, they're able to get out of the business of hosting servers, running servers on an ongoing basis, and actually focus on the things that retailers typically care the most about is, is product assortment, product price, how do you optimize across the different channels? Mm -hmm. You know, increasingly we're seeing our customers, uh, I think in, in direct response to uh, Amazon's growing footprint in the market, um, struggling with uh, their strategy uh, and investment around the, the offer, the merchandising offer. And uh, in the extreme case, we, we've seen that, um, you know, as the frequency of the pricing increases, the volatility of the price point on the SKU actually increases. It's almost counter to the uh, uh, intuitive assumption that, that prices would arrive at some sort of you know, stasis or that race to the bottom effect. Um, how do you guys view uh, Amazon as an opportunity or a threat to your customer base? And then do you have any thoughts on kind of how pricing strategy or tactics are evolving in the market? Right. I think that when you look at Amazon, you have to look at it on an industry by industry basis. So, you know, when we talk to our customers about Amazon, if they're a branded manufacturer, we encourage them. We say that is absolutely something that you should be doing because you have a unique product and you want to expose it to a broader audience. You know, I think for those of you who are retailers out there, you understand that there's a little more risk that Amazon probably can turn around and go talk to the same suppliers as you are and probably talk about you know, buying and transacting at a much higher volume. So you know, I think you have to look at it on a, on a brand by brand and an industry by industry basis. Um, you, you know, I think that uh, our manufacturing partners um, or branded manufacturers, there's an opportunity to be, I think, a lot more strategic about how you price things because you are actually creating the product. And then you can do things like looking at, well, you know, what is the demand elasticity that exists on my own site relative to the amount of traffic I have? What's the pricing? control that I have there versus selling on Amazon. And, and really, uh, you know, I think that you can make some very strategic decisions in terms of how you price things on Amazon based upon your desire to drive volume because there typically is so much volume that can be driven by Amazon versus the high cost of driving traffic to your own site. So, right. Yeah, clearly Amazon and Google provide an opportunity to look at where demand is high, but you know, potentially selection or inventory is low within the market. and. If you're agile enough in that manufacturer role, you can literally produce to fill gaps in, in uh, supply within the market. So, okay, well, uh, any, any closing thoughts or remarks? 
Uh, no, I mean, I think that, um, I guess my, my only closing thought or remark is that um, the, the level of sophistication that, that is being asked of retailers is, is continuing to increase. Um, the, the, and I think that there's a really important role that the people who have historically been focused on e-commerce can play in terms of educating the physical retail side of the business. Uh, and so I think that you know, tools like what Mercent brings to the table um, in order to be able to be aware of what the latest prices are and then use those across every channel rather than just keeping them locked away inside of the e-commerce team is something that, that I think is, is, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, when we look at what you guys are doing around things like pay-per-click management, uh, it's a very interesting opportunity for us because unlike a lot of folks here, we have more than just an e-commerce platform that exists. So we're able to draw data from all of the different transactional channels to make more informed decisions about you know, pay-per-click buys and things like that. So uh, you know, I think there's a, a really great fit between what you guys bring to the table in terms of marketplaces, Google, Amazon, and our ability to actually quantify return on investment on a lot of those things. Yeah, great. Well, Andy, thanks so much for your time and contribution today. Appreciate your willingness yeah. to come out and join us at Mercent. Great. Enjoy the show. Thanks so much.